What's going on guys, Graham GSM Matthews here with my audio review for the July 9th, 2021 edition of Friday Night Smackdown. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week slash weekend. Uh, quite the newsworthy episode of Smackdown this week, and it usually is an enjoyable watch, but this week more than any other in recent memory, which is saying something, because Smackdown's been good for the better part of the last nine months, but specifically recently. On Friday's show alone, we got new matches made for Smackdown next week, Money in the Bank, new competitors revealed for Money in the Bank, a couple of returns, and new call-ups as well. So, like I said, a very newsworthy episode of SmackDown. We'll get right into it. Be sure to check out all my other SmackDown audio reviews right here in the channel in the description box down below. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Uh, so let's get right into it. We open the show with Roman Reigns and the epic entrance that I can't wait to uh, see for the first time in front of fans next week on SmackDown. This was the final SmackDown of the Thunderdome era. It was an end of an era on Friday night, and thank the fucking Lord, we are finally, finally leaving the Thunderdome. And it's, it's cool, too, because I enjoyed this show, but I feared going in that it would be a tough watch. Coming off that great episode of AEW Dynamite on Wednesday in front of fans on the road in Miami. And to go from that to then having no fans at all for SmackDown inside the Thunderdome, I knew it was going to be tough. Um, the show didn't really, the, the show was good enough to where it really didn't matter. But I can't express how happy I am that we're finally getting back on the road with these shows for WWE starting next week. At least AEW, to their credit, in Daly's place, they've had a fraction of a crowd for the better part of the last year. Uh, not early on, but like starting in September, October, they had some fans in attendance. WWE, which is nice for safety protocols, but they have had no fans at all in attendance for any of their shows except for WrestleMania weekend earlier this year. So this was the final show inside the Thunderdome. We're in, not Fort Worth. Fort Worth is uh, Money in the Bank. I think it's Dallas next week or Houston. I think Houston is first, then Fort Worth on Sunday. And then in Dallas for um, Raw on Monday, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm looking forward to those shows. And like I said, they set up several matches for that first SmackDown back in front of fans next week, which I thought was cool. But like I said, Roman Reigns has not had this epic entrance of his in front of fans yet. He debuted this new song of his a couple of weeks after WrestleMania. Why they didn't just debut it at WrestleMania itself, I have no idea. Um, but they waited until a few weeks after WrestleMania for that Universal Championship match against Daniel Bryan on the show. And it's going to be cool to get that vibe uh, from the fans in the building next week for Roman Reigns' entrance. So he was out there. The Usos came out. First Jimmy, followed by Jay. And we got to address the elephant in the room here. Um, the news on Jimmy Uso. Being a fucking idiot once again. Getting yet another DUI. Not his first. Not his second. Not even his third. His fourth DUI in ten years. In addition to other incidents he's had... Um, you know, I don't think the Naomi incident was a DUI thing. I don't think that was a DUI, but he was stopped by police. And um, the fact they were stopped was weird because I think they just got lost or whatever. Um, it was him and Naomi in the car. But I'm pretty sure um, he had some sort of altercation with the police on that night, and that was about two years ago. Jimmy, or did I say Jay? I meant to say Jimmy. I apologize if I said Jay. Jay has had his run-ins with the law as well with DUIs and stuff like that. But Jimmy specifically has got to be up there. I mean, with the most DUIs in recent company history. I mean, we've seen people busted for DUIs before, Jeff Hardy being one of them. He was busted quite a few times in the last couple of years alone in WWE. Um, and my biggest issue remains not just with the Usos and with Hardy and people like that, but like WWE as well. Clearly the performers are at fault. But WWE always puts out that statement saying the WWE superstar X, Y, or Z, you know, just plug in the name, are responsible for their own actions, which is true. But it sends the wrong message when these people are on the road drinking and driving, nearly killing someone, which hasn't happened yet, to my knowledge, but it's inevitable. The longer this goes on for, the likelier it is that it's going to happen at some point. And WWE is going to be even in deeper shit. And yeah, clearly they would fire their person at that point, but it's not going to look too good on them when this person was guilty of being involved with DUI after DUI after DUI, and WWE would do absolutely nothing about it, at least to our knowledge publicly. But the fact he was even on this show, and I enjoyed what they did with the Usos and Roman on the show, setting up the six-man tag team match for next week, 
you know, I enjoyed it very much, but it is an issue. I mean, the guy should not have, have even been on the fucking show. You would never even know that anything was wrong. And Roman, you know, clearly acted like he had an issue with Jimmy, not just in character. He had mentioned, he made that passing comment about how um, there were a lot of things about last week that I didn't like, which to me, you know, was kind of him referencing the DUI, which I don't know if that happened last week. I don't remember, but I know the news broke on Tuesday or maybe it was Wednesday. I don't remember. Either way, though, uh, you know, they got to do something about this shit. They got to do something about it. He's got to either go to rehab, they got to let him go, or something along those lines. And it's not just, I mean, it is a Jimmy issue, but this goes for any performer under contract to WWE. Time and time again, they continue to turn a blind eye to this type of stuff, and at some point, it's not going to have a happy ending. Someone will get killed on the road, whether it be the performer themselves or, God forbid, someone innocent, which happens all the time. It's a fucking DUI. People drink and drive constantly, way more than it should be happening. It shouldn't be happening at all, obviously, but, you know, for all this talk about, and I know it's legalized now, but, like, even when marijuana wasn't legalized, and I'm not, you know, a pot person whatsoever, but, like, WWE would find people and suspend people for having it or smoking it, having it in their system, whatever. And the fact it was illegal before in certain states, you know, I get that. But still, having, you know, these DUIs and, and, and doing what they were doing was illegal as well. And they would put out a statement about it, like I said before, that evergreen statement about, oh, well, so-and-so is responsible for their own actions. But when it gets to a point when they're fucking injuring, let alone killing people on the road, they can't be putting out statements like that anymore. So the fact that he was even on this show was fucking gross. Um, clearly they're not going to take any action in terms of taking him off the show, because if it really was that serious, and trust me, it's a very serious situation, he would have not even been on SmackDown. I was thinking for a moment there, maybe they'll have Roman attack him, or Jay attack him, or whatever, and then they'll write him off for a while, so he can go get the fucking help he needs, but clearly they're not going in that direction. Jimmy was on the show, he'll be on the show next week, he'll continue to be on the show, and listen, I'm someone that has thoroughly enjoyed the Usos and Roman Reigns angle. I think it's been great. But at the end of the day, what's more important, continuing this storyline or getting this guy the help he needs? It's probably the latter, in my opinion. We got Jay back on the show anyway. So it's not even like they absolutely need Jimmy Uso around. Maybe they'll do, maybe they'll do something next week to write him off. I'm not betting on it for a second. I'm not counting on that whatsoever. Because if they were going to do something along those lines... They would have done it here. I know they want their precious six-man tag team match, and that should be a great match. But the guy should not even be on the show. Because, again, it sends the wrong message as to that you can do this type of shit and then not be rewarded for it, but, like, act as if nothing ever even happened. So, we'll see what happens with that. I really don't think anything more will happen. He'll probably get slapped with a fine of some sort. Clearly, officials, and specifically Roman Reigns, has got to be pissed with his behavior. Uh, it affects Jay as well. Jay has been guilty of this shit as well in the past, but he's been clean for a little while now in terms of kind of keeping his head out of trouble and whatnot. Uh, Jimmy, not so much, unfortunately. So we'll see what happens with him. I'm not getting my hopes up. It's not even like, oh, I want to see the guy fired, but WWE has to take fucking action here. Because I'm telling you, the more they let this shit slide by, the more it's going to happen, and someone will get hurt or killed. And... Worse yet, it may not even be the person responsible for the wrongdoing. It could very easily, more likely, be someone else on the road that wasn't stupid, that wasn't drinking and driving, and was merely the victim of a, you know, of a dumb action like that, of a DUI or someone drinking and driving or whatever. Someone like a Jimmy Uso. So, I thought I would address that right off the bat, but the segment did see the reunion of Roman Reigns, Jay Uso, and Jimmy Uso, as I mentioned. Jay Uso has been off the show for like close to a month now. I think the last time he was on the show was when the Usos lost their SmackDown Tag Team title opportunity to the Mysterios, or twice in the same show. They never explained why he was off the show. He wasn't hurt. Um, It was reported the other day before SmackDown that it was merely a storyline reason as to why he wasn't on the show. And they kind of alluded later on in the backstage segment that he wasn't on the show because he was getting sick of being between Jimmy and Roman because he wanted to side with Roman but he was also wanted to side with his brother, Jimmy. Um, he didn't want to be between them anymore, so he took some time off. He just walked away. He couldn't handle the bullshit anymore. He couldn't handle the drama anymore. But he was right back on the show, reunited with Roman, reunited with Jimmy. And now for the first time, they're all on the same page. 
or at least for the first time since like 2016 when they were teaming on a regular basis. But, you know, beyond that, as heels, this is the first time since Jimmy's return back in April, um, April, May, or I forgot exactly what, I think it was May, that they're all now officially on the same, on, on the same page, which is cool. Um, we'll see where it goes. Again, Jim, Jimmy should not even be on the show right now. That's a whole other issue. But they are on the same page, which set the stage for next week's big six-man tag team match, which I'll get to a little bit later on. Before then, we had our first men's Money in the Bank qualifier of the evening, pitting uh, King, King Shinsuke Nakamura, whatever the fuck they're calling at this point. He's still just Shinsuke Nakamura to me. I'm against Baron Corbin, who still does not have entrance music. He's without a car. Um, he's been missing payments on his car, missing payments on his house. He's been late on that stuff. He's got people calling him, asking for money, you know, all this other stuff. We found out before the match that Nakamura and Rick Boogs actually picked up Corbin's now former car at an auction for mere pennies, they said later on, uh, for a very dirt cheap price. So they had their match. Biggie was at ringside for this because Biggie is involved in the men's money, the bank qualify or in the men's money, the bank ladder match at the pay-per-view next weekend. Um, he had his own little couch, he had his feet in water, um, you know, for like a, a, whatever it's called exactly, but he's done it before, um, he's done it before at ringside for like Apollo Cruz's matches and stuff like that, so we did it again on this show, and Pat McAfee joined him while still doing fucking commentary, they both did commentary from the couch, and Biggie's done this before where he's had the headset on, and he's doing commentary from the couch away from Michael Cole and his partner, I think it was Corey Graves at the time. Pat McAfee actually joined Big E with his feet in the bowl of water as well while doing commentary, which I thought was fucking awesome. Uh, Big E's been, or uh, Big E too, but Pat McAfee's been absolutely great on SmackDown commentary, I gotta say, since joining a few months ago. He's been such a great fit for that role. And uh, as someone who wasn't overly high on him from the beginning, at the beginning a couple of years ago, um, he's really grown on me in the wrestler role, as a promo guy, and now as a commentator. He has been a breath of fresh air for this show. His enthusiasm may be annoying or obnoxious to some, and he can be over the top at times, but a lot of the time it's fun, it's a nice change of pace, and he's a perfect example of what a heel commentator should be. But I don't even know if I can call him a heel commentator. He was, he was getting along really well with uh, Big E in this segment. He wasn't giving him a hard time or whatever, so there is that. It is worth mentioning that not once, not twice, but at least three times on this show, let alone in this match, in the span of like 20 minutes, uh, Pat McAfee was making jokes at the expense of Baron Corbin's hairline. Um, <laughs> I mean, they don't really mention Baron Corbin's hair issue a lot on this show. Even when they shaved, even when he shaved his head a couple of years ago, they weren't making jokes about it. You know, there were there all those memes years ago about Corbin's hair when he was losing his hair more and more that they would like on memorabilia on WWE Shop. They would like fill in where the baldness was on Corbin's head. Um, I don't know if that was ever proven to be true or not, but if you look at the side by side picture and like the plaques from like Money in the Bank with him holding up the briefcase, in actuality his hair was really thin. But on the WWE shop plaque, his hair was all filled in, which was just weird. I know his hair didn't look great, but just to look like it was filled in looked even more bizarre. You know what I mean? Because everyone noticed it, and he eventually shaved his head, but. Uh, he, he's not growing the hair back, but he kind of has, I don't know exactly what you would call it, but he has more, what is it called, peach fuzz or whatever, more hair there than he's had in like three years, and McAfee's like really making fun of him for it, um, which tells me, I mean, it's it's hilarious, but it probably is a case of Corbin and McAfee just being really close friends, because they've had a lot of people on commentary before that could have made fun of that, they never did. Um, and now McAfee's doing it multiple times in one match. So I would be very surprised that they weren't close friends from their NFL days, because otherwise, what a dick. I mean, he just won't leave this guy alone. But they really want you to show sympathy. Really, they, they really want you to sympathize with Baron Corbin. And I think what he's doing right now, as I've said before, it has potential, and it's slowly, surely, slowly but surely growing on me. And it's become one of the better parts of SmackDown in recent weeks. And moreover than anything else, it's completely different than anything else he's done up to this point, including in NXT, including as the GM, as King of the Ring, and all this other shit he's done in recent years. Um, this, you know, downtrodden Baron Corbin, this character that he's doing right now, it has potential. And it really is interesting, because again, he's playing the role well, 
It makes perfect sense for him to be down on his luck coming off the loss of his King of the Ring crown, which is completely pointless, but... You know, they're, they're giving meaning to the crown with Corbin insinuating that he had more money while he was King of the Ring and all this other stuff. So, I like that a lot, and I'm very interested to see where they go with it. Clearly, he lost here to Shinsuke, as he should have. There was no reason for him to win. He was not going to win that fucking brave case. Um, I don't know if this means that we're going to get a babyface run out of Corbin at some point. How well that will work out, I don't know. The early stages of the storyline, though, are intriguing. And I'm very interested to see, moreover than anything... How the crowd's going to react to it starting next week. Will they get behind the guy? Are they just going to continue to boo him? Are they going to sit on their hands for the guy? I don't know. But either way, it's a nice change of pace. And they're really putting a lot of effort in like the segments. And really, the attention to detail is what really is most impressive to me. Because we don't see that a lot with WWE storylines. It's really kind of boilerplate, basic shit. Like, just insert X, Y, and Z and that's it. Booking. Um, but you know, the, the, the vignettes with his car and the promos and his acting and everything, I think has been great. It's been really, really good. So we'll see where they go with it. Um, the next segment on the show saw Natalia and Tamina out in the ring for a promo. We have not seen Natalia and Tamina on SmackDown in quite a while. They are the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, which allows them to show up on Raw as well, which is primarily where they've been since winning the championships a couple of months ago. But SmackDown's women's division now, with the injury to Bailey. Now that she's, I think, injured her ACL or MCL or whatever it is, we now know she's going to be out for nine months at least. At least. That puts her on the road to, the, to a comeback around, unless she can really speed up the process, around WrestleMania. It sounds like she won't be back until after WrestleMania, what is it, 30, um, 38 next year? That's terrible. The timing could not be worse because Bailey has done the best work of her entire main roster career, maybe even including NXT, but I really was partial to that NXT Bailey character um, as a heel in the last year and a half, two years. Really, during the pandemic era, Bailey has grown into her own as a talker. In ring, she's always been good, but she's had some great matches with Bianca and with Sasha, among other people. She's been one of the biggest, if not the biggest, MVP of this pandemic era for WWE. This stuff with Michael Cole and the Hell in the Cell matches and her reign as SmackDown Women's Champion. She has thrived without an audience. And she gets hurt literally one week before they go back on the road during a training session at the Performance Center, which was designed to get them ready to get back on the road. I mean, that just fucking sucks. So, the women's division is now depleted on SmackDown. I mean, it already was depleted, but... They literally before had maybe three or four active women on the show. They had Carmella, Liv Morgan, Bailey, Bianca, and that was it. Natalia and Tamina weren't really on the show a lot due to being the women's tag team champions. Um, Sasha's currently inactive, but she will be back, I assume, next week or the week after to prepare for SummerSlam, which I'll get to in a moment. So she was gone and has been gone since WrestleMania. Sonya's on the show, but she hasn't actively wrestled in close to a year. I really hope she's close to a comeback because she's been very good in the official role. But it is interesting that we've seen more and more of Sonya on SmackDown than we have Adam Pearce, which tells me that they're probably preparing Sonya for an in ring comeback if she's on the show as much as she is. Because otherwise, I mean, yeah, I guess they could just be doing it for heat and to get people behind Liv Morgan, that type of thing. But we've been seeing a lot of Sonya on the show lately which tells me that they're probably just preparing her to get all this heel heat for when she's ready to come back soon. Um, but anyway, so they had Natalia and Tamina in the ring, cutting a promo about being the women's tag team champions, who cares, only to be interrupted by their opponents, the debuting Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox. Now, they call them Shotzi and Knox, which as a team name isn't terrible. Tegan Knox is still Tegan Knox. She has, dropped, she has not dropped her first name, just Knox. Oh, here comes Knox is fucking dumb. So I'm really glad they're not just doing that. Um, Shotzi on its own isn't great. I see no reason to why drop the black heart name. That just makes no sense to me. Um, and it wasn't even a dumb last name. Shotzi Blackheart is a pretty cool name. But um, she is just Shotzi now. It's just Shotzi. So they came out as a tag team in the tank and all, beating Natalia and Tamina their first night, and not for the titles and non-title action, but picking up a big win in their debut, which they should have. There was no reason for them to lose here. The match was fine, but I got a lot of questions. I got a lot of questions. I have a lot of thoughts on this. First of all, it's cool to see Tegan and Shotzi on the main roster. Can NXT rebound from this? Absolutely. NXT has so many women that we don't even see. 
They signed Priscilla Kelly earlier this year. She's never made a single NXT TV appearance. So they have a lot of women waiting in the wings at the Performance Center. A lot of women in the roster that are already on the NXT women's roster that we just don't see enough of anyway. Like Saray or Saray, I forgot how you pronounce her name. Um, she hasn't wrestled in a while. Probably in close to a month, if, if, if that. On the show, she hasn't wrestled in a bit. We need to see more of her on the show. Frankie Monet hasn't competed in a few weeks. She's got to be more of a regular. They got her there. They don't need to, you know. NXT will be fine. So, WWE calling up a bunch of women is really interesting to me. Um, Io Shirai was not among them. We had three. Shotzi Blackheart, Tegan Knox, and we found out soon after on the show via a video package that Tony Storm is also on her way to SmackDown. I think those are three great picks from NXT. Um, another issue with this, and not issue, but like another observation, is if you were going to need a team for the for the women's division on the main roster, or just more women in general, why wouldn't you call up Shotzi and Ember as a tag team? I mean, they've been teaming for months now. They are former NXT women's tag team champions. They've gotten their chemistry down to a T. They are currently on NXT feuding with Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai. Why wouldn't you just call them up together? Did they not want Ember? Did they? Did Ember, you know, go out of her way to say, "Hey, I'm not ready to go back to the main roster yet. I just got back to NXT. No thanks." I know Tegan's been brought up for dark matches in recent weeks, which is why I think that this was all done by design, and that they always wanted the team of Tegan and Shotzi, and it wasn't an Ember Moon thing. So, it, it, Ember might have said, "Hey, I'm good for now." I just don't think they wanted her back in the main roster yet, which is why they called up Tegan instead. I like the team of Shotzi and Tegan. They've actually teamed before uh, for the women's tag team titles on NXT. They actually challenged um, Sasha Banks and Bayley to a tag team title match about a year ago on NXT, and they lost, obviously. But they make for a good team. Um, the other thing is that Tegan Knox literally just returned on Tuesday's NXT. <laughs> they, she just came back, and they've been doing the promos for weeks. You knew they wanted to build to a Tegan Knox candice LeRae match. I've said before... I think Tegan Knox against Raquel Gonzalez would make perfect sense, given her history with Dakota Kai and Raquel. Raquel debuted on NXT TV, attacking Tegan Knox at TakeOver Portland last year. I don't think that's where they're going with this. I've always said, though, oh, Tegan being the one to take the belt off of, um, off of Raquel would be perfect. Clearly, they're not going in that direction. Now, are they going to keep Tegan and Shotzi in NXT long enough to finish up their feuds there? So we can get Tegan and Shotzi, or get Tegan and Candice, or we can get Shotzi against Raquel, which is what they were building to at some point. I hope. I mean, it didn't look like they were setting it up for a future takeover anyway, which they haven't even announced yet. But like for a future episode of the show. And at this point, yes, it would be extremely predictable. We know Shotzi, even if it was for the Women's Championship, is not beating Raquel Gonzalez uh, for that championship or just in general. But it would be a nice farewell for her from the brand. Um, I have no problem with these women on the main roster. I think just with Tegan and Shotzi specifically, they have stuff going on in NXT, and this move just reeks of desperation. Now, again, I love the move to bring them up to the main roster, and I feel like the idea was always to bring them up to SmackDown. They just kind of rushed the process because Bailey got hurt, and that is a big void on that brand. Even when Sasha comes back, they still need more women. In this draft that's been rumored isn't coming up until after SummerSlam, which isn't for another, you know, maybe two months, less than two months. That's too long. I don't know. I just would have liked to have seen them get some closure in NXT um, before getting called up. But they are two great fits for SmackDown. Um, Shotzi will fit right in on that brand. I like Tegan a lot on SmackDown. It's a blessing. Honestly, it is a godsend that Tegan is even on the main roster at all. This woman, in her, what, four years with WWE has been hurt three times. And all three times, she was out for a year with major knee injuries. She was supposed to be in the Mae Young Classic in 2017, got her out for a year. Came back in 2018, she was in a couple rounds of the Mae Young Classic, got hurt again. Got hurt again, and she had to miss a year of her career. Came back in 2019, she was in the ring for all of probably less than a year before she got hurt a third time. And she's been out for close to a year since then as well. She got hurt last summer. It's July of 2021. So you would think that Vince or whoever on the main roster would look at her and think, oh, she's too injury prone, not worth it. But I'm glad that they're high enough on her to keep her around. And not even just keep her around, 
but put her on the main roster. And I like Tegan a lot. I think she's great. So I'm really happy she's uh, she's on SmackDown now. For Tony Storm, I think she's probably the best fit of them all, honestly, for SmackDown. And she's someone I have no issue with them calling up right now because she wasn't doing jack shit in NXT. And honestly, she really hasn't since she came to NXT late last year, which is disappointing. I think Tony's great. She turned heel, which was probably the best thing for her. She is more of a natural babyface, so if they debut her as a babyface, that's fine too. But she was ready. I mean, she had her last match on the show, what, two months ago against Zoe Stark, beating her in a rematch from the pre-show of TakeOver Stand and Deliver. She hasn't wrestled much at all. She lost a bunch of matches in recent months. Um, they were never going to put the championship on her. So her getting called up was fucking perfect. I have no issue with her getting called up. My only issue is, at least with Tegan and Shotzi, Tony got the video package treatment. But why not wait until next week? Why not wait until next week when there's fans? I mean, may not have. I, I doubt everyone in the audience would have known exactly who Tegan and Shotzi were. But they would have at least gotten some sort of a reaction from the fans in the crowd. My only explanation is, again, they hit the panic button. They needed women on the show, like, literally immediately. They saw Bailey got hurt, and they called these women up later that night. That's my guess. That and or they want to put them in the women's Money in the Bank ladder match for SmackDown, and they wanted to at least establish them first with a win before they announced them for the match next week. So, because we also found out in the subsequent segment that Liv Morgan is now in the Money in the Bank ladder match, taking Carmella's spot. I was I was thinking for a second that Carmella, who was announced as the number one contender, by the way, on this show by Sonya Deville to the SmackDown Women's Championship held by Bianca Belair. I'm thinking, okay, they're not doing the match of Money in the Bank. They're doing the match on SmackDown instead, which I like a lot. The match is coming together on a week's notice. It makes perfect sense to do on a SmackDown, the first with fans, as opposed to the pay-per-view. Because you know Bianca's not losing that title. So, I like that a lot. Carmella did absolutely nothing to deserve it. She lost her last two matches to Liv Morgan. But again, the whole point is that she didn't deserve it. So that's why I I get it from a storyline standpoint. But Liv Morgan has now been added, taking Carmella's spot in the Money in the Bank ladder match next weekend. Zelina Vega was already announced last week. That leaves two spots open. Could they go to Natalia and Tamina? I fucking hope not. I really, really hope not. I mean, I guess they can give Tegan and Shotzi a title shot at the pay-per-view, which would disqualify them from being in the match, but if you do that, then who do you give the final two spots to? Liv Morgan has a spot now. Sasha Banks could be one of them, but I think they're doing also to gain viewers but and have it be a special show. But I think part of the reason why they're doing Bianca and... Um, Carmella next week on the show is because Sasha Banks is coming out right afterward to confront Bianca or challenge Bianca. And I hope they wouldn't do the match at Money in the Bank on a two days notice, save it for SummerSlam. But I'm pretty sure Sasha has been advertised for that first SmackDown with fans for months now, at least for a month or so. So she's not being advertised for that show by WWE right now. Um, she may be, you know, she might be added at some point officially within the next week. But I think it's a better chance of Bianca wins and then Sasha comes out afterwards to confront Bianca and set up the SummerSlam rematch. That makes perfect sense to me. But again, it goes back to my original question. Who do those last two spots go to? I would give them to Tegan and Shotzi. I mean, Tony Storm is an option as well. Um, Honestly, that might be what they do. They might give one of the spots to Tony and then the last spot to Sasha Banks and then Sasha can win the whole thing and I just think that'd be dumb. Sasha can come back and contend for the championship on night one. She's that big of a star. She's not a loser in booking terms from a booking standpoint. She doesn't need the briefcase. For her to come in, win the briefcase, and say, oh, Bianca, I'm cashing in on you at the pay-per-view, I think would be dumb. I really do. I think that'd be stupid. She does not need it. Um, I would rather see it go to a Liv Morgan, to be honest with you, or a Naomi or someone like that. Sasha Banks has never won the briefcase before. I don't think she needs to win the briefcase is the thing. Um, I just feel like it would be a waste of a spot in the match. So just have her come back next week, confront Bianca, lead the briefcase out of it, and give that those last two spots to either Tony, Tegan, and or Shotzi. Or I'm not even sure who else, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know. I honestly really don't know. I would just give the last two spots to Tegan and Shotzi. That's what I would do. So I already talked about the Sonya segment. Uh, Sonya gave the last spot, or one of the spots, in the women's Money to Make Ladder match to Liv. 
And Liv said, hey, when I win that briefcase, I'm cashing in on you, Carmella. And I hope you do win the championship next week because I want to cash in this contract on you to become champion. And I don't think Carmella will win next week. I don't think she should win next week. Um, but I like the story they're telling with Sonya and Liv. I don't think that should be a feud over the championship, at least not now. But that would be a great idea, though, to branch off into a Sonya Liv feud based off what we've seen from them in recent weeks. So I'm looking forward to seeing more from them um, in the division going forward. We also had on the show another men's Money in the Bank uh, ladder match qualifying match between Cesaro and Seth Rollins, which was the fourth match they've had in recent weeks, a recent month. They had one at WrestleMania that was won by um, Cesaro. They had a rematch on SmackDown that was also won by Cesaro. They had the match at Hell in a Cell that was won by Rollins, and this one was won by Rollins as well. So Rollins punching his ticket to the Money in the Bank pay-per-view for the men's ladder match. Um, Another very enjoyable match. I really do feel like this should be the end of the road for this feud for a while. Um, They work really, really well together, obviously, but it's time for something new for both Cesaro and for Rollins. So I'm hoping that this is it for now. It was a great match. Rollins wins, clean, Cesaro bleeding a gusher after getting legitimately busted open, which made for a great visual. And, um, yeah, Rollins was the right choice, though. I've seen a lot of people say, oh, WWE, why are they burying Cesaro by not putting him in the ladder match? People claiming that he was a favorite to win, what what fucking show are you watching? Cesaro already got his shot, and I love Cesaro, but he already got his shot a couple of months ago at Backlash. He lost. They were not going to put the briefcase on him. It would it, it would have been cool to see him in the match, and honestly, I might I might have put him in a match over like a Kevin Owens, who I also love, but he was never going to win. He was never going to win. Maybe a slight shot of it, but Rollins winning makes more sense than Cesaro winning in this match. Rollins even laid it out himself right after the match was over. He and Roman obviously have history in the Shield, but he cashed in the briefcase the first time six years ago on Roman Reigns in the main event of WrestleMania. And they've been teasing a lot of tension between Rollins and Reigns in recent months um, since Rollins came back. So to kind of go off of that, feed into it, and do a match between the two at some point makes perfect sense. But Rollins should not win the briefcase. He doesn't need the briefcase. Clearly, this is setting up for him and Edge, who confronted Rollins backstage on this show, uh, with Edge getting the title shot before Rollins, which Rollins was really pissed about. It makes perfect fucking sense. So hopefully we do get that at SummerSlam, as was teased here. And then we got the main event segment, and you know, speaking of Edge, it featured Edge, calling out Roman Reigns. Roman told the Usos to stay in the back. He would handle it. The Usos thought something was up. They thought it was suspicious, which something did end up happening. I'm thinking, why would Edge have backup? Who would be backing up Edge? And I completely forgot about the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, go figure, the Mysterios, who we haven't seen on the show in a couple of weeks. So the Usos back up Roman. Roman clearly not happy with the fact that they're out there with him. And they're all about to ambush Edge. I mean, Roman and Edge start brawling anyway. But before the Usos can get involved, out come the Mysterios. We have not seen... We haven't seen Ray since the Hell in the Cell match three weeks ago. We haven't seen Dominic on the show in a month after he got yeeted to ringside by Roman Reigns. So we haven't seen him on the show in close to a month. They all brawl, super kicks galore, 6-1-9s. I thought this was a hell of a segment. A great brawl. Um, the babyface is getting the better of Reigns and the Usos. You know, Reigns took some offense there, but it was really the Usos getting their ass kicked by Edge and the Mysterios in the ring. So, Edge does the same thing to the Usos that he did to Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, the same thing he did to Jay Uso or Jimmy Uso last week. He did it to Jay here as well, laying out the Usos and laying the groundwork for what we now know um, as official, as made official on Talking Smack today, that it's going to be Edge and Ray and Dominic Mysterio versus Roman Reigns and the Usos at SmackDown next week, the first SmackDown in front of fans which is a big match you can do. I got a feeling that we were going to be seeing the match after the segment was over, and now it's been made official. I think that is awesome for a number of reasons. One, you got to make the show special because it's the first SmackDown back in front of fans. Two, you got to build an edge in Roman at the pay-per-view. And three, Roman Reigns rarely wrestles on SmackDown. He may have had this year so far maybe two matches on the show, I want to say. He faced Ray inside Hell in the Cell uh, for the championship a few months, or last month. And he faced Daniel Bryan back in April. So he may have had a match before that. Um, the Steel Cage match with Owens was in 2020. So those may have been his only 
matches on SmackDown so far this year, which would make this the first non-title match that he's had on SmackDown in 2021. So a rare in-ring appearance from Reigns, and also from Edge. Edge has not wrestled on SmackDown since right before WrestleMania when he faced Jey Uso. I'm pretty sure he beat him, too. Maybe it was a DQ, but I'm pretty sure he beat... Yeah, he did beat Jey Uso, because when he beat Jey Uso, he became the special guest enforcer for Roman and Bryan at the pay-per-view for Fastlane. So, um, only Edge's second match on SmackDown this year. And it should be great. Edge and Ray have worked well together before. You got Dominic in there. That's a great get for that first SmackDown back in front of fans. And hopefully they're as hot for it as I hope they will be. Um, but that was a great way to close the show. Again, the, the Jimmy Uso aside, which is a fucking embarrassment. And WWE's got to do something about it. He shouldn't even be on the show right now. And they're doing a great job of telling the story. I get that. But still. I mean, the guy should not even be on the show. It's a fucking embarrassment. Um, but SmackDown overall, on a positive note, was a great show this week. I thought the Edge, Roman stuff was great. Great setup for next week's big six-man tag team match. We're also getting a fatal four-way next week. In addition to Bianca Belair and Carmella for the SmackDown Women's Championship, we're getting the Money in the Bank men's qualifiers against each other in a fatal four-way match. Rollins, Big E, Kevin Owens, and Shinsuke Nakamura colliding in a fatal four-way, which sounds great on paper. Um, you now we got Shotzi and Tegan Knox getting called up to the show. Getting called up on the show to SmackDown. We got the announcement that Tony Storm is also on her way. We found out about Bianca's opponent next week. We got Liv Morgan in the women's ladder match. We got Rollins in the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. We got um, Nakamura in the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Progression with the Baron Corbin stuff. This was a really, really good show. It breezed by. I did not watch it live. I wasn't spoiled, though, by the call-ups, which was good. Um, but still, I thought it was a great show overall. Great storyline progression, meaningful matches, good matches, and some newsworthy moments with a few fresh faces getting called up. So there's no way that this is anything less than a two-thumbs-up worthy show, in my opinion, for the July 9th, 2021 edition of SmackDown. Thank you guys for checking out my review. I appreciate it. Be sure to stick around for my Talking Smack review tomorrow here on the channel, followed by my review of Broken Skull Sessions with Kevin Nash. Um, the video goes live, the episode goes live on Peacock tomorrow, on Sunday, but my review should be up on Monday, so keep an eye out for that. This week alone, we've had interviews go up with Eva Marie on Monday, uh, WWE Raw Superstar, and WWE Global Ambassador Titus O'Neil. Uh, that went up on Wednesday, and today in article form over on DailyDDT.com, ahead of the ESPYs tonight, which O'Neill is going to be a part of, as he was nominated for the uh, Muhammad Ali Sports Humanitarian Award, which is awesome for the second straight year. So we had a great conversation on Wednesday. Check that out. And uh, be sure to just like this video, drop a comment, share the video, and uh, subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Quite like this, we have SmackDown audio reviews pretty much every single week. We do Raw Talk re uh, reviews. We do Talking Smack reviews, Q&A videos every Wednesday, exclusive interviews, as I mentioned, uh, podcast excerpts. We had both Alexis of uh, Alexis was on both by the way this week uh, hashtag and Russell Rant Radio so check those episodes out and we do Loki reviews here on the channel every single Friday and we should be doing a Black Widow review as well uh, one of these days I actually got to see the movie on Thursday very good uh, we'll have a chance to break that down at some point in the coming days I would imagine so have a great one guys I'm Graham Jason Matthews enjoy the rest of your weekend and I'll catch your ass down the road.